And my name is Jen Hicks. I am the Director of Communications and Outreach at Maine Woodland Owners. This program today is sponsored by Maine Woodland Owners in partnership with uh, certified professional loggers and more specifically Mike St. Peter who is safety services with certified um, professional loggers or log logging, logging professionals. Sorry, I got that name wrong. We are very lucky to have these folks here today to provide some safety and maintenance training on chainsaws. I know it's a very popular topic and we're really glad to be offering this today. We've been doing these virtual information sessions since March as a response to the um, safety protocols that we needed to institute uh, during this time, this, during the pandemic. But as we have been doing these, we realized this is a very, um, this is actually a very uh, popular approach to delivering information. And that's a big part of our organization's mission is to provide um, programming for our woodland owners. So today we are gonna spend a few hours with Mike and his, um, and his uh, colleague, Steve Lorison. And they are uh, folks who do trainings on a regular basis. I just wanted to off let you know that this program is a member service. We're glad to provide this for our members. We um, have offered it to the general public as well. And we've asked that if you're not a member to become a member. And if you are not a member, but not ready to be a member, if you wouldn't mind providing a small donation to our organization to support these services, that would be wonderful. So visit our website, mainwoodlandowners.org. I'm gonna do a quick introduction to Mike for Mike, and, and then I'm gonna pass it over to these folks. Um, so we don't, um, so we have plenty of time to do the, the program and, and um, for folks to ask the questions they have. Uh, Mike St. Peter is the owner of St. Peter Safety Services of Jackman, Maine. Um, and established safety consulting from over 40 years of experiences in the forest product industry. And one of his clients is Certified Logging Professional Program. He also works with the Maine um, Department of Transportation and Land Trust, University of Maine, and numerous municipalities. He's got really a lot of experience. I'll just ask that folks mute themselves as we uh, get into this program. So make sure you're muted. Steve Laurelson is from Salon, Maine, and he's a ch chainsaw safety and directional felling instructor. Um, Steve has experienced all aspects of safety training for uh, conventional logging. He is also a Maine licensed arborist. So again, thank you folks, the two of you for being here to provide this terrific service. Um, I just, uh, just a few rules of the road. Um, like I said, everybody should keep, keep their um, sound muted. Um, that way we won't have any interference in our audio. The other is that we are encouraging people to ask questions, but because there's so many of you today, the uh, jumping in and asking a question is going to be a little hard to manage. So we're asking that everybody, as you come up with a question, go ahead and send it in message form on the chat. And that's why I've asked everybody to practice by sending hellos on the chat feature. If you have not um, opened up your chat window, make sure you do that now by uh, mousing below this video screen and clicking on chat. You'll see at the bottom a little space to type in. Um, as questions come in, I will, I will let Mike know that they're coming in. I'll read them out and he'll answer them as they come through. There will also be a time at the end for some questions and so we'll try to figure out a good way to, to um, manage those. But this is definitely an interactive program today. Mike's very curious, wants to make sure he's answering the questions that people have. This is also the first time that I think Mike's done a, a real live program. So he and uh, Steve are working together to make sure that the video and the audio is uh, going to work for everybody so you can see what they're doing. And I'm confident that it's going to work out just fine. But if, uh, if I'm starting to see that it's hard to see what he's doing. I'm going to jump in and I'm going to say, hey, get a close up. We want to see more or can't hear you. So I'll be providing the feedback for Mike and Steve as they're doing this. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mike St. Peter, Jackman. I'm going to keep my comments uh, short. We have a lot of information to get through today and hopefully we can make you better, safer, 
more efficient chainsaw operators. That's our goal. Uh, these are challenging times, as Jen mentioned, and uh, it's great to be able to give you this information. I think that overall, uh, my experience has been that folks have been out and about in the woods more so than usual in, in these challenging times, and certainly uh, safety should not be uh, compromised. So. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to pass this over to Steve. Uh, before that, I'd just like to quickly go through the agenda here. And, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to talk about PPE today. We're going to talk about chainsaws in regards to safety features, proper starting and handling, filing, and get into reactive forces. And... Uh, and a lot of information in between all of that. So uh, certainly we want to make sure that we cover your basic needs uh, and uh, we'll, do, uh, we'll do our best to, to get that accomplished. So with that said, Steve Lorison is my associate. He does uh, uh, many, many training sessions throughout, throughout the course of the year and uh, I'm going to have him jump right in. So. Uh, we'll talk to you folks in a bit. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Thank you, Jen. And what I would like to ask is that if anybody doesn't understand or cannot see what we're presenting, to make sure to let Jen know so she can interact with us. And we'll do our best to make sure that both you understand and can see what's being presented. So without further ado, I'm going to present the what we call the PPE, the personal protective equipment. And I've collected throughout my time as a trainer some defective equipment so I can show you what we mean by when we say defective. And the equipment would be the head protection, eye protection, hearing protection, leg protection, foot protection, and gloves for the hands. And so on the hard hat, what we have is called a logging hard hat. And I'm going to get close and let me know if you can see this fine. That was the dog's toy. This is what we call a logging helmet. And you have the head protection, the eye protection, and the hearing protection all connected together so that when you go out in the woods to do whatever you're going to do with a chainsaw, you have accomplished the protection of those areas. The hard hat is basically a molded plastic shell and it is subject to deterioration through the UV rays of the sun. Most if not all hard hats have a date stamp somewhere on the hard hat. And our understanding is three to five years usage in the sun. And what happens throughout that time is the hard hat becomes somewhat unserviceable. We do what's called a flex test to make sure that the integrity of the hard hat is still suffice to protect your head. And in doing that, what we do is we place our hands right by where the ears would be and we flex the hard hat like this. You don't want to collapse it, just enough to flex it. And what you're looking for is no sound, meaning you don't want to hear Rice crispy snap, crackle, and pop. If you do, that means the hard hat has been compromised. It's too brittle, and it's not going to be suffice for protection for you out in the woods. So what that means is, in the case that it is brittle, you have to change it out and get a new one. So uh, this particular hard hat, and again, if I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it or not, but there are cracks. So this hard, hard hat became unserviceable. This was at a DOT camp at one of the trainings that I did. And I, I said, well, if you're not gonna be able to use it, let me have it so I can use it as a demonstration. So I hope everybody can see there are cracks on both sides, and it happens to be where the earmuffs plug in. And that used to be a very tender spot, if you will, 
Uh, and that's not to say that's the only place a hard hat can crack. I've seen them cracked wherever there's some very hard bends. It depends on the usage and where they go once you're done with them. A lot of the loggers just throw them in the back of the truck or behind the seat, and sometimes they get damaged that way. The other thing with a hard hat is if you should be, and I like to say for, fortunate and unfortunate, fortunate enough to walk away from a hard impact, but unfortunate that you received one, um, and it should impact the hard hat, uh, don't chance it, even though it might not be cracked, you don't know the integrity of the hard hat after a hard impact, and it's always best to change it out and get a new one. So hope everybody understands that. Now, when do you wear the hard hat? Whenever there's overhead hazards. So if you're going in the woods and you're gonna be using a chainsaw, you wanna don the hard hat. All right, now I've taken the suspension out because I've done a lot of field interviews for loggers and I've found hard hats when they are on the, on the guy's head, they're off sideways. And I said, well, let me take a look at the hard hat. And what had happened is some part of the suspension has been uh, cracked and broken. And this is your collapsibility or your buffer between the impact and your head. And so you wanna make sure that every part of the suspension is whole and complete and good. These can be purchased without having to buy a new hard hat in the event that the suspension is damaged. So that's why I have this out of this hard hat. So that's your head protection. Eye protection comes in the form of safety glasses or the screen. And whenever you're using the screen as your eye protection, you need to have the screen down when the chips are flying. So what I advocate whenever I do a training is that whenever you're gonna start the saw, you're gonna go cut wood. That means the chips are gonna be flying. So a lot of times it's put the screen down and put your earmuffs in place if you're gonna use earmuffs even before you start the saw because your heart's going pit-a-pat, you're looking for something to cut and you wanna make sure that you're protected. Now the criteria for serviceability on the screen is you cannot have any holes or rips in the screen, especially the frontal part of the screen. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little puncture hole right below my finger. And I can only surmise that the guy wearing this hard hat, a lot of times when you're going through thick underbrush, you're gonna put the screen down because they're, you're subject to getting slapped in the face with a cold branch and that doesn't feel good. And there more than likely was a branch that, a little branch that stuck through and then he backed up and that's why the strands uh, pulled back out through the screen. As far as the field interviewer goes, this little puncture, even though it's small, it's right in line with the eye, would be a no-go, meaning it's a fail that screen would need to be replaced. If the puncture was way down in the corner or uh, upper corner, I would say just watch it. If it gets any bigger, then you, you're gonna need to change it out. I personally have had hard hats that where the visor rubs against the screen, it would split. And so a lot of times the debris comes down on your hard hat, it will filter down in through that split. And then when you look up to see what's going on the top of the tree, all that debris that's laying there on your screen, guess where it's going? Into your eyes. So there's a couple things there. Um, if there is debris, even though you don't have any damage to your screen and that happens, when you go to look up, make sure you tap the screen so that you don't end up with eyes that are uh, going to be a problem for you because <laughs> I worked in the woods for eight years for Scott Paper S.D. Warren and uh, gone home at night wondering what size the log was in my eye and it was just a very little tiny tiny debris but your eye is so sensitive and a lot of times you can't see it and you wonder if you're going to get to sleep that night and finally do because you're so tired, but the next day you wake up and it's in the 
in the corner of your eye and it's just a little speck, but that's how sensitive your eyes are. And we only have two of them, so you wanna make sure they're protected. Now the other eye protection would be safety glasses and on your safety glasses, they need to be wrap around for your, uh, for your eye protection. They need to be real safety glasses. They can't be generic uh, sunglasses. And uh, your safety glasses have a stamp on either the bow or uh, the lens itself. And it's gonna be Z, which is the abbreviation for ANSI, which is an entity from the US government that kind of oversees safety for employed uh, people. And they're tested, the glasses are tested for impact. So um, they need to be wrapped around for chainsaw and, uh, if that's what you're gonna use, that's fine. Some people use both, uh, safety glasses and the screen, and there's nothing wrong with that if you use both. So that's your eye protection. And again, the whole concept is you need to have them in place or they're not gonna work for you. Secondly, or, or thirdly, is your, your hearing protection. And your hearing protection comes in the form of ear muffs, which is what's on this hard hat or earplugs. And I, knew, I know people who use both and there's nothing wrong with using both. These chainsaws produce a decibel level of over 100. And even though they've improved the muffling effect of the chainsaw, it's still very high. And the rate of damage for decibel is 85. So you can see we're well above that running a chainsaw. And so it's only to our benefit to always have the hearing protection in place when we start the saw. And serviceability, if you're using earplugs, I use them one time. And uh, once I'm done with that day, those earplugs get thrown away. You can wash them, but I, I, they're not that expensive. And I do know that the EAR brand uh, will muffle the noise better than these muffs. But as I was working in the woods, I always chose to use the ear muffs because it held a hard hat on my head when I had to bend over. Um, serviceability on the muffs, this particular muff, the seal on it is perfect. On this side, you can see that very thin membrane of plastic that forms the seal around your ear has been compromised, and that does happen over time. When this happens, you can actually get what's called a hygiene kit. This seal pops out and that inner foam comes out and you put the new foam in and the new seal around it and you're good to go. And uh, again, it does you no good if they're up like this when you're running the chainsaw. You need to have all this stuff in place to protect yourself. So that's your head protection, your eye protection, and your hearing protection. So then we go on to leg protection. And I have seen, sad to say, on the front page of newspapers, a first responder going to uh, a situation where there's a tree down, either in somebody's yard or on the road, and they've got chainsaw in hand, no head protection, no eye protection, no hearing protection, and no leg protection. And to me, that's not a good indicator to the public on how you should be approaching uh, running a chainsaw. So that's why we advocate what we do. Now, the leg protection comes in two different forms, either the chaps like this or cutter pants. And the cutter pants, I'll show you, I brought mine. And uh, these are the cutter pants. They form uh, a protection around your upper thigh all the way down to where they overlap the top of your boots. And that's the criteria for how far the, the uh, cut resistant material has to go on your leg. And so you need to, if you, any of you people out there that are real tall, you have to make sure that you get your chaps or your cutter pants so that they extend down to overlap the top of your boots. And we'll get into the foot protection in a minute. Now, uh, the other thing is 
if you go out there and do your shopping for your leg protection, you want to make sure that you buy something that has integrity in it. There's stuff out there that has never been tested. Um, these app have the UL tag right on them, and that's just the underwriters lab, which is the United States testing facility, and they take product in and they put it through a battery of tests to make sure that they're going to perform the way that they're supposed to. And uh, what they do with the chaps and or the cutter pants is they've got a jig where they put the chaps on and nobody's foolish enough to do this. So they have a ham that they put the chap around or the, uh, the cutter pants on and they have a chainsaw on a jig and they're able to release it and it drops down onto the cut resistant material. They time it and then they examine it to see how far the cut penetrated in. And you want to make sure that when you go to get uh, protection for your legs, that you have something that's going to perform not just psychologically, it's going to be physical performance so that it will actually stop the saw before it engages into your leg. And of course, anybody with any common sense, you have to let go of the throttle. You don't keep the throttle bared down when you you know, make a mistake and hit your legs. So first thing you want to do is make sure that you let go of the throttle, hope to God the chain brake works, and, uh, and then check and see if there's any damage. And what I've seen before on, on the cheap pairs of cut resistant material chaps or, or cutter pants is that there's, there's gonna be a cut sustained all the way or mostly across the front. And when they flip it around on the backside, the ones that aren't very good, it cuts through. So that means somebody's gonna experience some damage on their leg. Then there's a medium grade where the cut is almost as long on the front, on the back, it's cut about in half as far as the distance across. But still, uh, that's not good because there's gonna be damage to the leg. And then the third pair, which is the ones that have the most loft or fluff, the thickness of the chaps, the cut is on the front side, flip it around and there's nothing cut through on the back side. That's the ones you want to get. If I could actually have you feel these, they're thick. And that means there's enough cut resistant material, which is either a ballistic nylon or a, a Kevlar material that's interwoven into a nylon mat. And all that together, when the chainsaw engages in the chap or the pants, tears in, grabs these strands of cut resistant material, holds it around the chain back into the drive side, which is where your drive sprocket and your chain hook together onto the side of the chainsaw. And it causes it to wad up in there because there's a very restrictive area in there. And that's what instantly stops the chain when you have good chaps or cutter pants. The ones that are uh, very thin, it, the chain keeps turning for a while before it actually wads up in there and stops. So I hope you understand what we're talking about here in regards to how the functionality of the cut resistant material works. As far as serviceability, uh, the difference between the chaps and the pants, of course, are with the chaps, you have all the snaps and buckles. And with the chaps, for serviceability, all the chap, uh, all the straps and snaps have to be functional and used. You can't say, well, it's hot today and I'm gonna buckle the top one and just the bottom one and I'm gonna leave one just flapping in a breeze. That's a safety hazard and you don't wanna do that. You wanna make sure all the buckles are functional so you can use them and have them all buckled. And, and the other thing is that I learned through a, a, a logger, a professional logger told me, and, and I give him credit for thinking, but I also give him credit, credit for uh, corrective action. And that was, he had buckled all of them, but he loosened them up as far as he could because he wanted a little airflow to cool him down because it's extremely hot. And he said when he was working, one side of the chap, it happened to be uh, the left side, had flared out like, like this and his saw caught on it. Well, I kind of have a question on what he was doing with the saw being that close to his leg, but 
Uh, he said, I didn't cut myself, but I learned right then I will never have my chaps that loose again. And so it's just something, you know, a lot of times we learn either through revelation knowledge, somebody telling us the best way to do it. Other times it's experiential knowledge, which is that's what he got, but then he shared it with us and we're able to share it with other people. So you don't want to gird it up so hard that it's cutting the circulation off or impeding your ability to move, but you want to cinch them up so that they're not just flapping in the breeze. This is what happens when you make a mistake. And I'm going to come a little closer so that you can see what's going on. These chaps came from a DOT camp. This wasn't even exposed. This is the cut resistant material that I was telling you about earlier that's interwoven into that nylon mat underneath this outer layer. And the guy, after we'd gone through the presentation, said, I want you to take and inspect my chaps to see if they're serviceable or not. All I saw was this little triangular cut, if you will. So I, I just kind of prodded around a little bit and I could tell there was something not right and this pulled out. Now, this might seem extreme to you that these became unserviceable because of this, but what you need is every strand intact and functional. If you make a mistake and tag your leg, you want every one of these to be functional to be able to pull out and stop that saw instantly. So any kind of damage to the cut resistant material on the inside renders these unserviceable. If just the outside duct part, this orange part is cut. I've seen them cut look like somebody used a Stanley knife and it cut right straight across. There's nothing damaged on the inside, but they're still serviceable. The only thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you, if you're going to sew it, you pull the outside material away so you don't sew into the cut resistant material and sew it up. Because if you don't, you're going to have a leg that weighs 40 pounds before you know it because all the debris that you're cutting is going to end up down in the bottom of that chap and you don't want that. So I hope that answers every question you have. If not, we will field the questions. So again, on the chaps, when you put them on, you want to make sure that, and I don't believe I'm going to be able to show this, but that it overlaps the top of your boot because a lot of the work done with the chainsaw is down low especially with the limbing and the bucking of the, of the logs. So that's why you want to have coverage uh, down so that it overlaps the top of your boot. So that's your leg protection. And uh, the, same, the same criteria as far as serviceability applies for the cutter pants. If you want to go with the cutter pants. When I was working in woods, that was my personal choice. I worked beside guys that chose to use the chaps, I always use the cutter pants. And uh, they, they function the exact same way. Foot protection. If you read the chainsaw manual that comes with the chainsaw, everyone that I know of says that when you're running a chainsaw, you want to have heavy leather boots that are slip resistant, that are crush resistant, meaning the toe is a crush resistant toe, and they're cut resistant. I don't believe it's mandated by the state that you have to have cut resistant boots, but it's your feet. And I'm just going to say, for me, it's always going to be the cut resistant boots on whenever I'm running the chainsaw, because I understand what happens when you make a mistake and the protection that these afford you. These are cut resistant boots. <laughs> and these are actually made in Sweden and they're HAIKS, H-A-I-X. I was always told that the orange welt that runs along the bottom of the sole was an indicator that they're cut resistant. Well, I was at a Lamy Willahans one time and I was asking the girl there because I saw a pair on the shelf and uh, I said, are those cut resistant? She said, well, I don't know. She went to look it up and they weren't. So that's not an absolute telltale that these are cut resistant boots. You need to make sure if you're gonna go with cut resistant boots that they're indeed cut resistant boots. And uh, so that's your foot protection. And we've covered the whole gamut. The only other thing would be hand protection. And I know when I worked in the woods, it was, we, we handled cables uh, and chokers on the skitter. And so 
I always use leather gloves. Uh, some of the guys use um, just uh, cotton gloves, but my choice was always the leather gloves because of the puncture possibility. And we advocate that you wear your, your gloves. If you choose to go barehanded running the chainsaw, that's fine, but if you're gonna handle the chain and or surface the chain, by that I mean taking it off and servicing your bar or filing, always wear gloves. And uh, I don't know how many of you guys or girls have been out there filing barehanded and go to uh, run the file through and you slip. And the next thing you know, you've got a bloodletting situation going on because your teeth are razor sharp. And when you run into it, uh, it's inevitable. That's what's going to happen. So gloves when you're filing and when you're maintaining the chain and the bar. So that's the PPE. And what I would like to go on to now is, I don't know if you can see very well, uh, but what I did was I made a, a little platform and this is kind of like for training and on the tailgate uh, for filing the chainsaw. And all it is is uh, a platform enabling me to put this little stump vise, which is just two prongs on a molded piece of, uh, of metal with a little screw to attach to the bar so that you can do a much better job at filing. So I have that on there right now, but what I would like to do is show you uh, the safety features on the chainsaw, what you need to make sure that's functional before you run the chainsaw. And if it's not functional, you take the chainsaw out of surface, get it repaired, and then you're back in business. And so there's three major safety features. I'm going to put my gloves on because I'm going to start handling the chainsaw and uh, I might peradventure grab the, grab the bar. And so I can do that like this because I'm protected. So with the chainsaw, we've got three major safety features and I point to this one, although this is just a, uh, a hand protector and a paddle to engage the chain break, which is housed in underneath this side cover. And so we wanna make sure that the chain break is functional and we'll go over that in a minute, but that's the chain break number one. Number two is the throttle lock. That's this little paddle, if you will, right here that prevents the throttle from being activated unless this throttle lock is depressed. And I can remember when they first came out with these guys were taping these down with electrical tape. And the thing is, if you're running a chainsaw right, when you grab it, it automatically depresses the chain break, I mean the, the uh, throttle lock so that you can actually activate the throttle. This, I've seen this before, the little spring on the inside goes bad. And so now, any kind of branch or, or, or a stem that touches this when you don't want it to be throttled up uh, can activate the throttle. It's not a good situation. Uh, if you're cutting a lot of spruce and fir and or pine softwood, uh, a lot of times this will get filled up with pitch and that will actually pin it down so that it's, it's locked down so the throttle can be activated when you don't want it to. So you've got your chain break your throttle lock, and then thirdly is your chain catcher, which is attached to the side of the chain. So uh, most of the time on the power side with a little bolt. Some of the smaller saws come with on the drive side, there's a, a plastic molded chain catcher. Uh, I don't like it, but that's the way it is. And if it gets broken off, then you've got to get a whole side cover. Whereas with the ones that are bolted on the side, if you throw the chain more than a couple of times, this is gonna take a disappearing act and you have no little beacon light or beeper saying that it's gone. So you have to physically look at it every time you take the chainsaw out to run it. And you're gonna know if you throw the chain, meaning it, disrail, it derails while you're running the chainsaw, you're gonna more than likely look and see the damage done. And I've run them before where there's been dings on it but if it gets compromised to the point where it's not gonna stop the chain for you, 
When this chainsaw is running full out, that chain speed is turning around 60 miles an hour, at least full out. And if you derail the chain when it's going that fast, <coughs> it has the potential, if the chain catcher is not there to whip around and hit you in the leg, hit you in the back of the arm. And one logger said, you know, the worst thing is it hit my, my gas tank and that was a hundred and something dollars. <laughs> You know, thank God it was just a gas tank and not him because it would have hurt a whole lot worse. And so those are the three major ones. Now, the other things you want to pay attention to is on your drive side to make sure sometimes if it gets dropped, the chainsaw, uh, this can get uh, cracked and broken. You want to change that out. You don't want to leave that with any kind of gaps or, or holes. That's the bad side. On your other side, you've got your Guess what's in behind here? A lot of guys are gonna say the recoil. Well, you ask the recoil, but your flywheel, what does the flywheel do? It holds in a volume of air that's about a hundred times what we breathe in. And it's there to cool and to feed the carburetor. And I've seen before where some of these little fins get broken out and that's not a good thing. And any of you people that have run the chainsaw uh, real close to your body, it's like a vacuum. You can feel it pulling. And if you've got your shirt untucked like this, I've had more than, I bet you 15 guys tell me that it's happened to me, loggers, that their shirt got sucked right into this uh, by the flywheel. And next thing you know, they've got an orange belly button ring right there because it's stuck right there and they can't get it off until they tear, cut, or rip their shirt off. And it was funny, but it wasn't funny. One guy told me, he said, you know, it wasn't so bad I lost my shirt, but I lost about an hour's worth of work because I couldn't start the saw. My shirt was tucked in underneath the flywheel and I had to get it pulled out before I could go back to work. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those things, that's gotta be an eye opener when that happens. So anytime you have any of those little fins that are compromised as far as being broken, you know, a lot of people say duct tape. Well, duct tape in the wintertime might be okay, but there's just enough airflow here without having any of this covered with tape to cool this thing. Because one of the worst things with a, with a two cycle engine is to not have enough air to cool it and you kill the saw. So those are things. And then the mounts, make sure the mounts are still good. Make sure that all the bolts and nuts uh, a tight, whenever I go to clean the saw, I dismantle most of it as far as the covers go, make sure it's clean. And then I take the whatever little uh, wrench or screwdriver that I need to, to make sure that all the nuts and bolts are tight. I've done field interviews, gone in and see guys that are pro loggers where their handlebar bolts, you could turn them by hand, didn't even have to put a wrench on them. I said, you can't have that, that's, that's just not good. Um, you want to make sure everything is secure and tight because, like I said, when these things are turning up, uh, they'll cut wood all day long. Believe me, they can cut flesh and bone. All right, so that's the safety features. A couple other things you want to pay attention to by law, and that is, a, I believe, a national law. You, uh, wherever your exhaust ports out, there's a little screen there and it's called a spark arrestor. And that spark arrestor is there to make sure that there's no spark spewing out of this thing that's gonna start a fire. I have run the saw in the latter part of the day when the sunlight was subdued and you'd be surprised at the sparks that come out even with a spark arrestor. But uh, if you don't have a spark arrestor, it's magnified by a whole lot more. And any of the guys that come in that have any kind of official duty in the woods, like Forrester, game warden, can come and say, let me look at your chainsaw. And if they see that the spark arrestor has been burned out, it's not there anymore, they can actually level a fine on you. Back when I was working in the woods, it used to be $35. And a lot of times the guys would grace you by saying, you know what, I'm gonna trust you to get it replaced and uh, I might be back to see you. And I'll tell you what, I always made sure that I got the spark arrestor back on. I used to carry it with me because that's one of the things that can happen. And it, again, there's no indicator to say 
okay, the spark arrest is burned out. So you need to make sure you check that. Uh, the opposite end of that is, and I've never had it happen to my chainsaw, but I've seen it on other chainsaws, is that it builds with carbon and it fills that whole screen so it can't breathe. And if it can't breathe, either in or out, it will not start. So that's another thing. If you should have a chainsaw that you can't start, I just look at the, the spark arrestor to see if it's, if it's carboned up. And if it is, it's an easy fix. You can either replace it or take it off and wire brush it so that all that carbon is gone and then it should start right up if that's what's causing it to not run in the first place. And then by law, the other thing is, and I'll come over and show you what I'm talking about is the, what we call the dogs. And that would be this right here. And it looks, it's pointed and uh, uh, they have to be on your chainsaw because again, your exhaust and your muffler is very hot. And I believe the standard is three quarters of an inch separation from the wood that you're cutting to the exhaust. So you need to have um, either dogs or a, a flat bar across there that separates excuse me, the chainsaw from the wood. So that pretty much wraps up the safety features of the, of the chainsaw. Uh, now, um, what I'll show you while I have the saw right in my hands is on the chain break application, uh, usually when we have a face-to-face uh, -face training, if you will, I always have everybody demonstrate to me that they understand how to activate and deactivate the chain break fluidly so that there's no guessing about how we do it. Now, one of the worst things you can do, I'm gonna activate the chain break is do this. Because look where your hand's going towards. And that's just not a good practice. And then if you wanna deactivate it, you let go of the saw, which compromises the control of the saw. So what we do is hands on both the front and rear handle finger off the throttle unless you're gonna cut wood or try to tune it. You don't wanna have your finger on the throttle. So either pull it off like this or bring it back so that it's back away. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna release the front grip ever so slightly so that I can rotate the chainsaw in that front grip by pushing down on the, the tail handle and watch what happens. I'm gonna catch this paddle and listen. It's that simple. That's activating the chain brake. To deactivate the chain brake, a lot of times what I do, I'm, my finger is off the throttle. I'm putting it, <laughs> kind of hard to see, but I'm putting it on my front thigh and I'm taking my front hand with my thumb wrapped, all four fingers, and deactivate the chain brake. So it looks like this. And I would encourage each one of you to practice that. Now, I see a lot of people take one finger and they're trying to pull back. And if you've got a good strong grip, you might be able to do it. Some guys try to take two fingers and do it. But what you're doing is you're pulling against your other two fingers and it's not good. Just take all four fingers, keep the front thumb wrapped, deactivate, activate. It's that simple. And then I see a lot of people do this and this is not a good practice. They're up like this doing it. And this is not comfortable and it's not a good standard practice. You wanna be relaxed when you do it. See how my arms are down, just like that. And so that's activating and deactivating the chain break. If, see a bell like this? Okay, so here's where you see where I got my finger off the throttle. I've, what I've done is I've released a lot of pressure on my shoulders, my back, and my, my torso by just allowing that. Uh, most of you realize that three points of contact is more control than two. And so what I've done here is, and then I've got my hand on like this, my front thumb is, is wrapped around all four fingers, just like that. And so when we test the chain break, a lot of people think, well, I've got the chain break on now. All I'm gonna do is, oh, I can't pull on it. So I guess, well, you pulling on it is really not a good indicator. I can tighten this chain up. 
enough so that even with that chain break off, I can't pull that around. We'll talk about chain tension in a minute, but what we want to do is we want to start the chainsaw with the chain break on, and the way we start the saw, we advocate the leg lock, and the leg lock is the hand grip comes from right over the saw to the first bend. And at that first bend, what I'm going to do now is chain break is activated. I'm going to put the saw between my legs and I go halfway between my knee and my crotch. Uh, anywhere in between there is good. And you put your heels together because you're using your legs to hold the tail end of the saw so it's not going to bounce around and you've got your left elbow locked. You don't want to have a bent elbow when you do this. So it's locked in place. <clears throat> this prevents the saw from bouncing around. The chain break is on <clears throat> and with your hand grip at that first bend, it produces for you the recoil handle so it's a lot easier for you to grab. And with the chain break on, we're going to pull the recoil handle until it fires. And by that I mean with it, when it's cold, you're gonna have to choke the chainsaw. And once it fires, and you can tell when it fires because it kind of makes a little pop sound. And then you will take the choke off, pull it, and once it starts, what you don't want to do is go and deactivate the chain break because instantly that chain's gonna start running at around 7,000 RPMs, which is high idle seven to 9,000 RPM. What you want to do is leave the chain brake on and hit the throttle. And what that does is it automatically knocks that chainsaw speed down to true idle, which is around 25 to 3,500 RPMs. And it's not activating the clutch to make the chain turn. So it's safe for the saw and it's much safer for you. So once we start the saw, we're going to hit the throttles and knock it down to true idle. Now we can safely take the chain brake off. And I've been taught and understand that two cycle, you want to let it idle for a little bit before you start hitting it real hard with the throttle just to warm up the engine a little bit. So I try to do that uh, in my personal practice and I would advocate you guys do too. Let it warm up for a little bit. And then what we're going to do before we go out into the woods and cut any kind of trees, any kind of wood at all, is we're gonna <clears throat> have the chain break off, hit the throttle, and at full throttle, activate your chain break, let go of the throttle. And if that instantly stops that chain, we know that chain break is serviceable for that day. And you only have to do it at the beginning of, of your work day. And so you don't have to do it every time you start the saw, it's only at the beginning of the work day. So it's, again, my finger is off the throttle. I'm ready to test the chain brake. I'm gonna pin the throttle, activate the chain brake, let go of the throttle. And again, if the chain brake is gonna work, it's gonna stop that chain up really, really quick. And that tells you, okay, I'm good to go with the chain brake. You have inspected the throttle lock and you have inspected the chain catcher and everything else. And so you're good for that day. So that's activation and deactivation of the chain brake. Now, the handling of the saw, I don't ever take for granted because I've seen all kinds of things as far as the uh, handling of the saw. Most people will understand this is a valid grip with your hand right over the power head. This grip I already showed you is for starting the saw. It's also a grip for doing uh, the first cut in the felling that we do with an open face notch. This creates about a 60 degree angle for that first cut down on your notch or your bird's mouth or whatever you want to call it out front. Uh, the two cuts that you make to create an opening for the tree to fall over. So that's a valid grip right there. And then this is a valid grip with a saw on its side. My preference is all the way to the end of the handle uh, for this, which would be for the bore cut and when we're filling a tree. So this is called walking the handle where you just, whatever position you need to be in, 
uh, you're walking the front handle. So basically you're just releasing your grip ever so slightly. It's a controlled roll of the saw is what it is. So there's one, there's two, there's three. These are all valid grips. So just get used to that. Cause I've seen people, when I say we're gonna do the bore cut, they don't release this grip and they try doing this. And I'll tell you what, right now I don't even like that because it's, it's, uh, it's not a good <laughs> position for you. So this is where you would roll a saw like this. And I don't know whether you can see or not, but each one of those grips, the thumbs are wrapped around both handles 100% of the time. And that's one of the things that you need to ingrain in your psyche when you're running a chainsaw, both thumbs are wrapped. You don't have one compromise like this or both like this. These, this is not a good position for you to be in. You need to have both thumbs wrapped whenever you're gripping the saw to do any kind of work. And the reason for that is for the possibility of a kickback. And a kickback is when you make the mistake and this top front quadrant catches on to anything. It's gonna violently kick back. And there's been people that have lost their lives because they didn't understand about the thumb wraps and they didn't understand about that top front quadrant being, I don't care if you cut the balsa wood, it's gonna kick back. It cannot, it cannot engage into the wood, it has to kick back. And so that's, that's how we grip the saw. And again, I can, one of the strongest things that I can uh, present to you today is the thumb wraps. Make sure both thumbs are wrapped, regardless of where your hand grip is on the saw. All right, so uh, I've already started to a degree on, on the kickback, so I'm just gonna follow through with the reactive forces now. And if I kind of go out of sequence a little bit, we'll cover everything. It's just, I'm gonna uh, go into this and I'm, what I'm gonna do is make sure that you understand what I'm talking about here. And we learned in school for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And remember I told you when this saw is running full out, it's, this chain is turning at least 60 miles an hour. So there's potential for some disaster to take place if you're not understanding what's going on. So given that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, if we engage the top part of the bar into some wood, meaning we're doing an undercut like this, either with a branch or a stem, the equal and opposite reaction is it's going to push the power head back towards us. And to learn that and understand that, the old adage to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Well, this is applicable here. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our grip, again, both thumbs wrapped, a good solid grip. And we're also going to position our feet so that we're shoulders width apart and our left leg is forward uh, so that we've got a good stance. And that way, because if it should produce that reactive force, which it will, and push back towards you, you wanna be standing so you can maintain an upright position. All right, uh, you know, my brother was a ski instructor for a long time and he's always telling me, you wanna have your, your legs apart now. Well, when I learned to ski, it was, how would I say this? It was stylish to have your feet together and do the parallel turn. Well, now it's about shoulders width apart for more stability, which is understandable. And the same thing goes with the chainsaw. You wanna have your, your feet spread, you know, good shoulders width and knees bent and uh, a forward stance with a, with a left leg. And that's going to maintain you in an upright position should you experience the pushback. And here's where I would ask at the end of the day, I'm going to point to this and you're going to tell me pushback or push side. This top front, I've already told you what that was. That's the kickback corner. Don't ever try to engage this. Know where this is at all times. Because 
If you get caught by surprise with this, boy, hope to God you've got your thumbs wrapped, you've got a good grip, and your chain brake works, because it's violent. And even though this is a smaller saw in comparison to what the loggers use, this is a good sized power head. It's almost full horsepower. So to get a good understanding and healthy respect for this saw, stop and think about the workhorses and just one horse, how powerful and how muscular that's, that horse is and put almost four of them in this package. And to think that we're gonna manhandle this if it should something go awry. Uh, all we're doing is fooling ourselves. So the best thing we can do is be prepared. Push side, kick back. The bottom front quadrant we call the attack corner. And that's if we're gonna do the bore cut, we're gonna distinctly use the front bottom part of the chainsaw. Let me get this over here so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is the push side kick back corner from here to here. And then from here down to here is the attack corner. And we had people back in the probably late 70s, early 80s that had learned, there might have been people before that. Loggers don't usually go and visit and talk about all their experiences. They do their job, go home and eat and fall asleep. Whether it's in the chair or in the bed, you're just tired. So from the front center to where the bottom of the bar actually starts, it actually pulls the saw into the wood. And we've done it so many times and it works, all right? So this is the attack corner and then this would be the pull side. And so when you use the chainsaw and go down on top of the branch or the log, it's gonna pull you and the saw away from you so again, it's good hand grips and good leg foot protect, uh, placement, all right? So that's, that's the reactive forces. And again, I wanna go over this and you can recite to yourself as I'm doing it because it's always good to hear yourself say it. So when I point to it, just say it. This is the push side of the bar, all right? I can see your mouths going. This is the kickback corner. This is the attack. And this is the pull side, all right? So just remember that, write it down. Um, and then when you're out in the woods, um, you're gonna realize when you go under the tree or under the branch, it's gonna push the power head back. This one here, you, know, you don't ever wanna engage that into anything. This one is the attack corner. And if the tree's standing up and you're going sideways, we're gonna go like this and then engage in. If the tree's laying horizontal like this, we're gonna go with the attack corner and plunge down in. And that's Steve, both, those, both of those are valid cuts. Steve, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Um, uh, Steve uh, says he can't see the end of the chain bar. And I'm wondering I, if that's... Okay, I moved it. Can he see it okay. now? Yeah, I noticed that because I, I saw the image of myself as it on my work. Okay. Push, kick back. This is the top front attack, the bottom front, and then the pull side. Is that better? Okay, so I, I think at this point, uh, we've gone about halfway through. Uh, let's just take, uh, let's say, five minute break and uh, we'll come back right back to you. Uh, does that sound all right, Jen? Yep, and if anybody, this is a good chance for anybody to send a question on chat, or when we come back, maybe I'll see if I can uh, facilitate a few um, questions, uh, verbal, you know, if anybody wants to speak up and ask their questions. So, so, you, so it's now 10.03, so if we come back at 10, uh, 10.07, does that sound okay? Okay, very good. All right, and then I'll try to see if we can get some questions going, if there's any. Maybe, maybe Steve, you're doing such a great job, we don't have questions. Uh, very well. Well, it's, it's always, it's, any question is a good question. So yeah. don't hesitate, and we'll do our best to answer the questions. I, I don't pretend, and I know Mike doesn't pretend that we know everything, but boy, 
we'll do our best to answer whatever you have questions. I'm starting to see a few. So we'll come back in a few minutes and then we'll, we'll see if we can get some questions. Okay, thanks. There's several questions that came through during the break. Would you like me to read yes. them to you and answer sure. them? Or have to, okay. Sure. Sure. Is there a difference between cut proof and steel toed boots for safety? Cut proof and steel toed boots for safety. Um, nothing, I, I should, uh, I should uh, uh, explain that there, uh, unless it's, it's uh, uh, steel, there's no cut proof boots. Usually the, bro the boots or the, the leg protection is cut resistant. Uh, I, I think the manufacturers are very careful about calling anything cut proof because you know you have a certain amount of liability there, and uh, uh, I, I think that uh, you know steel-toed boots. If you hit the cap of the boot, whether that's a, a steel toe or a uh, composite toe, uh, usually those uh, will resist uh, a chainsaw penetrating through. But as far as the uh, protection along uh, the sides of the boot or the front of the boot, those are usually cut resistant. I don't know if that answers the question or not, but we can get back to it if it doesn't. Okay. Um, as I've had a couple people ask if this video is gonna be available um, since we're recording it. And I've just explained that, Mike, you're gonna review this video, make sure that it's um, to your standard before we post it um, on our website. If it does get posted on our website, I will let this group know. So that's where we'll leave that. Yes. Right. Um, okay. You know, there are always things that we want to make sure uh, because it's it's in the public domain that we want to make absolutely sure that, uh, you know, we haven't misspoken or we're clear in our explanation. So uh, um, I'm sure that after we get a chance to review it, that you'll be allowed to have it, uh, have it be available to uh, your membership. Okay, great. And then can you damage the motor by running the saw with the chain brake engaged? Damage the motor with running? Uh, well, I, you know, I'm not a mechanic. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. And certainly, uh, you know, we're told that the chain brake is, uh, is similar to a parking brake. Now, if you uh, if you have an automobile and you engage your parking brake and you run it down the road, there certainly is the chance that you'll have damage. But if you use the chain brake in the usual manner, uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't be da damaging the, the the chainsaw. So uh, uh, maybe Steve, you can interject. the The question was, can you damage the saw by using running it with the chain brake? Well. <laughs> Two things. Number one, uh, you're, if you activate the chain brake, it's not going to turn. All you're going to do is burn the clutch out. And you'll know because smoke will start coming out the drive side. And that just, you don't do that. Uh, and to activate and deactivate the chain brake, uh, because we activate the chain brake uh, three distinct times. And one would be when you're starting the saw. Uh, second one would be if you're taking more than two steps because there's always tripping and falling hazards in the woods. And the third one would be if you need to take your hand off the saw when it's running. Because like I showed you before, whenever you let go of the saw, it becomes destabilized. And so uh, you, uh, with one hand, you always want to activate that chain brake. And the practice is you activate the chain brake not when it's running full throttle, except for that one time when you test it. And is there wear on the chain brake when you do that? Yes, there is. But it's I just like I tell people, go down the road, come to a stoplight or a stop sign, and in your mind say, well, I'm going to save my brake, so I'm not going to put them on. See how well that works for you. It's the same thing. There is a wear factor there. But all the times I've run a chainsaw in the woods, use the chain brake. I've only had to replace my chain brake band, which goes around the clutch three times. And so there is a wear factor, but you don't, 
You can't run it. You can't run your chainsaw, meaning you can't throttle it up with a chain brake on because it won't allow you unless it's damaged. And if maybe this was the question, if you put the chain brake on idling, it doesn't hurt the chainsaw at all because it's a centrifugal clutch, meaning it's not going to turn the piston in the chainsaw until you get it a certain RPM and at idling it won't do that. So I hope that answers the question. One, one important thing that you should all recognize or realize that if you're going to be servicing the chain brake uh, by taking the, uh, you know, taking the, the cover off, make sure that your brake is disengaged when you take that cover off. Because if it's engaged, you're going to have a heck of a time putting it back together. So it won't. It won't. So there, there seems to be a follow-up question um, that they always start. Uh, I always start my saw with the unit resting on the ground held by my foot. Is this proper? There's, there's actually three different ways that you can start the saw. We, I always prefer the leg lock method, but if you choose, you can. Keep the chain brake activated, put the saw on the ground, get your foot in the rear where the rear handle is. And again, uh, even with uh, the ground start method, you want to keep your left elbow locked. And you can start it that way. The reason why I don't prefer that way is because I got to get back up once I've done over. And then there's another one where you put the saw on the ground and you actually put your right knee right on top of the power head and you have your left hand uh, with your uh, left elbow locked and you can start it that way. So there's actually three different ways that you can start it, but it, each one of them is with the chain brake activated. Hopefully that, that answers your question there. But that's he was right. That's it for questions right now. Um, I think we can jump back into the presentation and then we'll try to, and then we'll, maybe we'll do some more questions. We definitely will do more questions, you know, uh, later in the hour. Great. Thank you. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to start talking about the chain and how to service the chain as far as filing it goes. And uh, I, I do have a, a larger example of the sawtooth <clears throat> and it's color coded. So this is what it looks like. And I'm gonna go through five parts of the sawtooth. We're gonna talk about what we call them, each part, what the function of each part is and how to address it as, as in filing. And so I'm going to run through real quick. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, we'll start from the front and work to the back. Realizing that we always file the cutter first, but I'm going to start from the front and work back. This is called the raker or the depth gauge. And its function is to regulate how deep the cutter gouges down into the wood to take a bite. So we're looking at a depth gauge that we want to maintain at a certain thickness or depth down from the cutting edge each time we service this chain. Then we're going to go to the little white portion on the, the front top of the tooth. That's called the working corner or the working point. And that's very instrumental in the functionality of your, your cutter teeth in that it is the furthest to the front and it's the furthest to the side. So it's what catches the grain of the wood and draws the tooth in to take a bite. And once you train your eye to see what it looks like on your particular chain to know when the point is where it's supposed to be and in, in, in what it looks like, 
then you're way ahead of the game as far as the functionality of your chain. Then we're gonna to go to the side plate. This is the side plate. Functionality of the side plate is it cuts across the grain. These are cross cut saws in that they're filed to cut across the grain. Meaning if you have a piece of wood, it's laying like this and you come in to cut down, you're cutting across the grain because the grain is running like this. If the tree is standing upright and we come in to cut, Again, we're cutting across the grain. So they're not, they're not designed to do a very good job in that uh, if we were to rip, which means cutting along with the grain as in cutting lumber. These do not do a good job at that because they're not filed for that. There's a specific filing for if you're gonna rip, all right? So that's the function of the side plate is to cut across the grain. And then we come to the top plate which has a distinct angle pre-ground from the factory, and that determines the width of your cut or how wide your kerf is. And we can actually change this depending on time of year and what our, our function is as far as whether it's softwood, hardwood, um, in the winter when everything's frozen rock solid, or in the summer when it's the way it is naturally in the summertime, all right? And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we come to, if I can get this, the yellow portion, which is underneath the cutting edge, and that's called the chisel angle. And the chisel angle has a distinct function in that it is designed to clear the chip out once it's severed from the tree. And I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but it takes two cutters to complete a chip. One cutter comes in and cuts one edge, and then the other one is angled the opposite way and it cuts the other side of the chip. And then the chisel angle has to help clear the chip out of the cutter so it can go take another bite. All right, so <clears throat> functionality, if we were coming around let me see if I can do this. Coming around the bar on the top side, which is the push side, coming to the kickback corner, which we're not gonna touch, around to the attack corner, and then on the pull side, and we're gonna set the saw down onto a piece of wood. This is how this tooth functions. The, the uh, raker or depth gauge allows the tooth to come down, gouge a chip, come back and clear. So it's almost like a porpoise swimming and it's going at a very fast rate of speed. I used to know, but I forgot how many times in a second a cutter will take a chip and, and cut a chip. I, I don't know, you guys can figure it out. It's the rate of speed, the length of the bar and, and how many cutters and calculate it all out. Somebody's already done that, but it's a lot in a second. So for it to function properly, we need to maintain the raker at 25 thousandths of an inch. And to give you a perspective on 25 thousandths of an inch, that's about the thickness of your thumbnail. So if you take a look at the, the thickness of your thumbnail, that's how far we wanna maintain that depth gauge or raker down from the edge of the, the cutter itself. If you choose to go farther down than that, what happens is the perception is oh, now I've got a cutting machine because it feels like it's gonna draw the saw right out of my hands and it's producing chips that are half a mile long. Well, the whole concept is really wrong because what it does is it heightens kickback because now you're gouging much deeper than the intention of the design engineers who designed this tooth and this chain to function. So kickback is heightened. And I'm gonna show you on the chainsaw a little, in a little bit, what it looks like, why kickback happens. And, and also in, the, in the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, there's a very good slide there that shows you that. But 
uh, when you drop this down too far, what happens is this gouges too much of a bite and it's, it, it uh, induces a much more violent kickback. It also causes the chainsaw to cut beyond the power band of the saw, which means when you're in the cut, it's going to bog the saw down. It won't stall the engine out, but it stalls the chain speed. And so you're ending up having to pick the saw up out of the cut so it can catch up to itself and get back to cutting speed RPM wise. And so you're actually producing more work for yourself and the saw by dropping the, the depth gauge down too far. Conversely, if you never touch the rake or a depth gauge with a depth gauge tool and a flat file, eventually it's going to be a very superficial cut, which means uh, it's not going to produce the speed and an efficiency that the chain was designed to do. So we maintain the rakers on an average if you're going wood dull, which means you don't get into the dirt and you don't get into the gravel uh, or dirty wood that's been skidded along some dirt trail and then picked up and you're going to cut it because anytime you get into that situation you're going to have to address it more often as far as the filing and the depth gauge but on a on clean wood you're filing the cutters approximately three times before you have to address your raker and what I do is simply put the depth gauge tool on, and I'll show you in a minute what that looks like and how to do it, onto the, onto the chain. And if the raker is protruding up above the depth gauge, your flat file is gonna catch it, and it's gonna knock it down to the 25 thousandths again. I've actually gone to 20 thousandths, which means it's five thousandths less of a cut, and it's hardly perceivable as far as the speed goes, and it reduces the chatter on the chain, on hardwood specifically, and it reduces the potential for kickback on people that are not versed with a saw very well. And uh, I ordered it online. It's an Oregon depth gauge tool. I'll show you what it looks like. And if I can bring this in close enough, I don't know if you can see it, but it's designated 0 0.020 instead of 0 0.025. And you can see there's a slot where your depth gauge goes through. You set it on the chain like this, and I'll show you in a minute what it looks like. On the bottom side, there's two little extensions or tabs on both sides to protect your cutter so you don't hit your cutter with the flat file. And so that sets on just like that. And again, I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. But that's the depth gauge tool. That's probably one of the most prevalent ones out on the market. There are different ones. That would be my personal choice because it's very simple to use and there's no mistakes made by it. <laughs> so does everybody understand we've got a rake or a depth gauge that develops the thickness of your chip, 25 thousandths, I'm down to 20 thousandths now. This is the working point or the working corner, and you definitely want a good point there because that's what catches the grain and draws the sawtooth in. This is your side plate angle. Remember I said it cuts across the grain, and it's actually only going to cut as much as this depth gauge lets it cut. This is your top plate with a top plate angle of 25 to 30 degree top plate angle, and it depends on what chain you have. Uh, as to what angle that you're going to maintain. And then we use a dip, uh, I mean, a uh, file guide. And the file guide looks, there are different ones out there, but it looks like this. I'll show you two different ones. This one is made by steel. Always want to use a handle. And this is a very simple dip uh, file guide to use because. Your file goes on the underside. You want to make sure you have the right size file diameter because it's very size specific to your chain. And it has some hash marks on it. I, let's see if I, there you go. And I've highlighted those with my magic marker so it's easier to see in the sunlight. And those are the ones that you line up with your top plate angle to give you what you need for a top plate angle on the 
on the chain that I'm using right now, it's actually 30 degrees. So this is a steel chain and uh, most of your other chains now are 25 degrees. This is a, an Oregon uh, file guide and there are different hash marks on there. And again, this one is a uh, 3 16th diameter file for the uh, 0.325 pitch chain. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And again, I've got the, the hash marks, that's 25 degrees. And then on the other end, it's 30. And that would be the one that I would use on this particular chain. So you need to know what you have for a chain and then you match your file up and your, your file guide up to your chain. So that's your top plate angle. And again, that determines the width of your cut, how wide your cut's gonna be. And then we go to, there we go, the chisel angle, which is underneath your cutter. And that's a 45 to 55 degree angle. And that's what helps to, to disperse the chip out of the cutter so it can go take another bite. All right, now, when you run your file, your round file through, it's relative. It's gonna address your point, your side plate angle, your top plate angle, and your chisel angle all in one stroke. So you wanna be very sure that you line everything up right and you, when you make your stroke across with your file, again, it's gonna, it's gonna address all four of those points on your cutter. So you're gonna file your cutter first. And the reason why we file the cutter first before we address the depth gauge is because your depth gauge tool rests on the top, uh, the top of your cutter, which as we file back is gonna diminish in height because for efficiency, it's running, it's, it's got to taper down towards the tail end of your, of your, excuse me, your cutter. And so as we file back, like I said, about three or four times, then it's going to be reduced in height enough. So then we should be looking to address the depth gauge. All right. So the reason why we go over depth gauge, point, side plate, top plate, and chisel angle is so we can interact with each other. And if there's any questions, we can ask uh, with an intelligent question, meaning, uh, well, tell me about the depth gauge or, or the raker. What does that do again? Or how far down we do, see what I'm saying? That's, that's why we know what it's called. And then uh, we, the function of it is the why behind it. So again, the raker determines the thickness of the chip, the point starts the cut, the side plate cuts across the grain, the top plate uh, angle creates the width of the kerf, and then your chisel angle does what? That's right, it clears the chip. And so there's a very good reference if you wanted to go online, uh, Oregon, which is the largest chain manufacturer in the world, steel actually has one too, but it's not nearly as extensive as this one, it's got a lot of good information in it. Uh, every chain that they develop and sell, it's got that information in it. And I'm sure they'd be glad to send to you uh, this little manual free of charge. It, it tells you about maintaining the bar, tells you about maintaining your drive sprocket. Um, it's got a multitude of information in there. So, whoop, address right there if um, anybody wants to take it down. And they've got an online address as well. I've talked to those people before and they're very nice and they'll disclose anything that you have for a question in regards to uh, the chain that you have. So before we put the file to the chainsaw, there's a tensioning that we need to understand for both filing and using the chainsaw as in cutting wood. And what I'll do is I'm gonna put my gloves on because remember I said, whenever you're handling and or filing, you wanna make sure you have the gloves on. And I'm gonna take the liberty, this chain is actually tensioned properly. And what, I'll take my gloves off so that you can see. And if you grab the chain, in the middle of your bar and pull up like you mean business, 
you want one drive link, which is the one that goes in the bar groove, to be just outside of the bar rail and the one in front of that and behind it at the top of the bar rail. And if you could see my fingers, there's an indent uh, where I've pulled like a mint business because that's how you test whether the chain has proper tension so you don't derail the chain out in the woods because it's too, too loose. And when you're filing, it's not flopping back and forth because it's too loose. So I will take my scrunch, which is the combination screwdriver wrench, and see what I'm doing? Making sure the chain break is deactivated, and I'm going to loosen this chain up so you understand what I mean when we've got a chain that's too loose, which would not be good for filing. See how that chain is sagging? You've got a, that's extremely loose and you'd never want to go try to cut, nor would you want to try to file with a chain like that. Conversely, you don't want it so tight that you can't draw it around the bar. And I'm going to show you how simple it is to tighten this up. All I'm going to do is turn the little screw that actually has a pin that goes into the bar and it's going to pull the bar back which or, or push it ahead which is going to and you can see it tightening that chain. Now I've brought it up so it's pretty snug but that's not where I want to be. It's still a little bit loose. So now what I'm going to do and this is what's recommended you hold the bar and chain up And all I'm doing is tightening that screw a little bit more and I'm testing and I'll show you in a minute. Now that I've got it where I believe it's suitable for both running it in the woods and for filing, I'm going to tighten the rear bar nut, the one towards the back of the chainsaw first, holding up on the bar and the chain while I'm doing it. Once I get this snug, what I'm going to do is test my chain tension again because I found out a lot of times when you think you got it right you tighten that bar nut up now it's too tight and you see how I can rotate this around there's no restriction so it's not allowing this chain to run smoothly and so I'm satisfied with the tension of the chain right now so I'm going to make sure this is nice and snug and then fetch up the front one and again this is both suitable for filing and running it in the woods. Once that's done, you know, I, I, I want to do one more thing because I, I just want to do this and this is a maintenance thing. I'm going to, I'm going to take it apart. I'm going to show you real quick. So hang on. I'm just going to, because this is something when you, you need to do this uh, depending on how much wood you cut, but you need to do this at least uh, after you've run the saw, you know, four or five hours. <clears throat> and this is part of the maintenance that you want to do. So all I'm doing here, of course, the chain brake is deactivated. You want to make sure that's deactivated. Taking the bar nuts off, and here's a little a little helpful uh, clue for you. Always. Take the tension off your, your chain by backing off that adjustment screw a little bit because otherwise this pulls off really hard. Now, and this is what the inside looks like. This is the band for your chain brake that goes around your clutch. And this is nice and clean. I, I used compressed air the other day, cleaned it all out. And so now what I'm going to do is take the chain off. And I'm just going to set that aside for right now. This is your clutch and your drive mechanism. In behind this is your drive sprocket. And that looks like, well, it could be 
rim sprocket like this. And again, it has an outside circumference. It's got a number of uh, drive slots in it. And you need to match that up. There is a wear factor. Here's another one, same thing. And the wear factor is about every third normal chain life. You want to be looking real close at your drive sprocket because uh, the outside circumference, this is a star sprocket that I actually found at a saw shop. And if you look where the chain connects on to the drive, it's actually worn all the way through to where this is, this is no good. This can turn all day long and it's not gonna turn your chain because it's worn right down through. The other thing I wanted to point out is in the clutch cover, if you can see it, there's a little needle bearing. I think maybe you can see, there you go. And that needs to be greased. And a lot of people don't know that, but that needs to be greased every so often or else there's gonna be a failure there. And so on these chainsaws that I happen to have with me, There's a little grease gun and it's got a very needle nose point on it. There's your grease gun for your chainsaw and there's a hole in your crank. Your crankshaft comes out here and this is designed because there's a hole drilled in that and then a, a hole perpendicular to that that you can actually take and pump grease in here and it will actually lubricate that bearing. Now I can't speak for every chainsaw manufacturer, but this Husky, uh, the Swedes did a good job in, I don't, I've got steel at home and I can't remember whether the steel chainsaws have that hole in there as well or not. If it doesn't have that hole so that you can lubricate that little bearing, then you have to pull the clutch off and pack the bearing with your finger with grease. And uh, it's one of those things, that I, I don't have the time to go over that today, but that's, that's how you would do it anyway. Uh, so the bar comes off like this, get the whole unit clean on the bar. If you don't have compressed air to clean the bar, there's a tool that you can get that uh, will do the job for you. This is one of them. This is a combination depth gauge tool see the slot where the depth gauge goes through but you see the little hooks on the end of that this is how this works if like again if you don't have uh, compressed air it sits in like that and then you just draw it backwards and that will clean the back the inside of the bar rail out and you flip it over and do the same thing on the other side paying attention to the little hole where the oil gets dispersed to lubricate your bar and chain. And let me see if I can, there's the hole right there. And you wanna make sure that that's clean on both sides. All right, because what you're gonna do is every time you clean this, you see how the Husky is right side up. Whenever you take this apart to clean it, you flip the bar over and that will prevent it from prematurely wearing in this position and in this position, because it's gonna slap. The chain is gonna slap there before it gets driven around, or uh, drawn around the, the sprocket. So that's just gonna extend the life of your barrel. So putting it back together, once it's clean, You want to make sure that it sets over your drive sprocket. And once that's done, then you just feed it around your chain. And what I'm doing now is I'm looking in to make sure that it's around the drive sprocket. And good job, first time. Sometimes I have to fiddle with it a little bit because it doesn't set over that just right. Okay, so now here's where it makes it easy to put side cover back on because I've pulled back that chain tensioner stud. And so now we're ready to put the bar nuts back on. 
and then we'll have to tighten it back up again. But that's, now that we know how to do that, it's not very complicated at all. And so I'm gonna fetch these up to where they're somewhat tight. And then I'm going to tighten the chain up. So I'm going to interject here a little bit. Uh, Steve, winter's coming, and uh, we've got to cut some wood, so you're going to have to show us how to do a little filing. Uh, we've got 15 minutes left in the program, so we're going to do basic filing and uh, um, and uh, make sure that we get that that firewood pile uh, growing. He's talking to me directly because I still have some more to do at home. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it done. All right, so I, I've done the same thing. I'm, I'm checking the taint, chain tension. I'm satisfied with it. I'm holding up on the barn chain together and um, cinching up the bar nuts. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put the file to the saw. And in doing that, I want to make sure that number one, I have the right size file for my chainsaw, which I do have out. And I'm going to use a vise. Like I said, it doesn't matter what you have for a vise. Whatever you have for a vise, and usually you have a hammer, but <laughs> you hammer fist, how's that? And now all I'm gonna do is set this on here, cinch it up, And what I suggest is that I always want to be in a comfortable position. And if I can ever uh, rest while I'm doing it, I'm going to rest while I'm doing it. So the right size file, diameter wise, for this chain. And I am going to take a magic marker and reference where I start because I am a counter, but if I start talking, I found out I can't count and talk at the same time. So <laughs> position this so that I'm going to be comfortable. What I like to do is instead of starting way up at the tip of the bar and trying to get as many cutters as I can before I rotate the chain, I get into a comfortable position, a static position, and I rotate every cutter to me. And so what we're looking for here is I'm, I'm going to start with my, my magic mark tooth. I'm looking at that 30 degree scribe line on top of my um, file guide. And I'm going to start by lining it up. If you can see that scribe line. And the only other thing we need to pay attention to is how far we drop down the tail of our file. And as I know, there's only square across which is, they call it zero, meaning we're not dropping the tail of the file down at all, or, or, or 90 degrees, which means from the bar, uh, an angle from the bar to the bottom of your file guide is exactly 90 degrees. And uh, the only difference is on some chains, they say to drop down 10 degrees, which is very little. And so what I'm gonna do, this particular chain calls for 90 degrees, but I'm gonna ever so slightly drop it down now, why am I doing that? To minimize the kickback, the aggressiveness, and it's hardly perceivable as far as the, product, the production end of it. So I'm just gonna drop down ever so slightly, keep my scribe line lined up, and, oh, I see what I did, I, I'm, I'm pinched. There we go. There we go. And so I've done one, bring the next one up, line it up exactly like I did the other one. <laughs> and the thing is, you know, if you've got a, a, a hammer and a chisel and you need to break up two feet of concrete or you've got a, a jackhammer, what tool are you gonna use? Whatever works the best. Well, this is a whole lot better because it's really precision hand filing. And once the guys got over their pride and decided the tool does work, guess what? 
they start telling other people that it works. So all I'm doing is, as I'm filing, I'm listening to how the file's cutting, and I'm also feeling if there's any kind of uh, damage to the cutter, it's actually going to do a little hitch to the file, and I can hear it. It's going to sound different. And so, so far, everything is good, and it doesn't take any longer. Actually, you can do a better job quicker by filing with a, with a file guide and a depth gauge tool than you can by what they call freehand. And freehand is basically where you take a file with no file guide and uh, a flat file to address your acres. And believe me, so I've done that. Now, you know what I'm doing when I do this? I'm cleaning the file. So that will take a good cut on every every two, and sometimes I do it a little more frequently than I just did, but it it cleans the file so you can take a a good cut on each one. And the other thing, did you notice I only pushed the file this way? I didn't draw it back in the cut, and that's because the file is directional. You'll ruin your file, and you won't do a good job filing if you draw it back in. So each time you pull the file out. Now. Did one side, I'm gonna do the other side. And it's basically the same thing. And if it looks like I'm going really fast, it's because I've done it a few times. When you start out, you wanna be looking at what you're doing, you wanna be looking at your cutters, you wanna be paying attention to your file. And once muscle, me muscle memory sets in, uh, it's gonna be, you'll be doing it like me. And, and Steve. I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's not that complicated. Steve. Yeah. Uh, someone is asking if there's a if there's a way to get a close up of, to see what you're actually filing. Uh, Mike's trying. Yeah, okay. we can do that. Uh, one thing that uh, Steve, do a couple strokes. One thing that's quite important. You'll notice his arm, his forearm and elbow, follow follow close to his body. So. It's this motion right here. So that's when you talk about muscle memory. Let me try to get close here. See, see what we can. How you doing? I'm gonna pay attention to what I'm doing. Right, the right, right, right. <laughs> so basically, if you notice, I'm taking two strokes on every cutter. This chain doesn't need to be filed, but I'm just showing you by putting the file to the saw so that you can understand. You see the cross, you see that hash mark right here, that's 30 degrees, and I've got it highlighted with my, with my marker, and you see how it's running parallel with the bar. And that's what you wanna maintain, because what that's doing is that's putting a 30 degree cut, 30 degrees on your top plate. So I'll go to the next one. And what I'm looking for specifically is the point, the working corner on each cutter. And if I see any kind of damage to the cutter and or the point, I might work at it just a little bit, a little bit more to get that trued up. And so that's basically, and I'm back to the red tooth. It's not blue tooth anymore, it's red tooth, but uh, that's, Remember I said you file the cutters first. So we have done that. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the depth gauge. Remember I told you I've gone to a, a 20 thousandths and that's what I've got here. When you set this on, all you want sticking up out of that slot is the depth gauge itself. And with this kind of a depth gauge, you want to try to maintain all your cutters at the same length because if I set this like this, you'll see that it's referencing off one, two, three, four different cutters. So we want this on a better, flatter plane than if they were all different heights. And it's just going to make much more efficient how your chain functions. So now we're going to take the flat file and see a handle on every file. And we're going to put this on. And all I'm going to do is hold the stable. And I'm going to run the flat file. I don't put a whole lot of pressure down. Very, very little down. 
I run the file across like this. And if the raker is sticking up out of that slot on the depth gauge tool, you're gonna hear a sound different than this. Listen. Hear the difference? It's going from a coarse sound to a very smooth sound. Going to the next one, and I'll do this to clean my file. And actually, it was like one little stroke that took that back down to the 20,000th. Listen, hear how smooth that is? There's no resistance on my file. And so, and that one there, none at all. And that one, none at all. So, because it's already been done, uh, I, I'm not going to take the time to go through all of them, but you would do all your cutters, all your rakers, and if you notice, I'm filing the rakers on the opposite side of the bar. And then I'll swing the saw all the way around, and then I'll file all the rakers again on the opposite side of the bar. If you try to file the rakers that are closest to you, I'm going to show you what it sounds like. First, I'm going to show you what it sounds like no gauge, what it sounds like when you're actually catching metal with the file. Listen. And now I'm going to file the one that's closest to me. Listen. Yeah, I can hear you and see you plugging your ears. It's not a very pleasant sound and it ruins your file. If I could show you a close up of my file, you can see a streak going right across the cutters and that's not good. So you always, yeah. Oh, someone's asking if it's a fine, medium, or coarse file. It's, it's called a bastard file. Forgive the name, but it's called a bastard file. And it's a six inch. And uh, you can actually buy them at like Tractor Supply and Home Depot uh, or any of your saw shops. Great. And I would say that it's probably a fine as far as the cut on the file goes, it's a fine. It's not coarse. Great. That answer it? I think so. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's fine. It's like <laughs> I said, I try to get us back on track every yep. time. Yep. Uh, so that's, that's the filing. And like I said, uh, once you tune yourself into how it feels, looks, and sounds when you have a sharp chainsaw, you're gonna know when it goes dull and you're not gonna you're not gonna put up with it. Because it's just half the work. Well, it's half the work and I'll tell you what, I like getting through things and so <laughs> it's one of those things where if I get even a little bit dull, I'm gonna stop and maybe get a drink of water and put the saw down get my files out and file the chainsaw, fuel it up, and then go back at it. Uh, and again, you will tune yourself into what it feels like when you're filing to know if a tooth really needs to be filed. And like I said, once you learn what the point looks like on your chainsaw, the cutting point or the working corner, uh, you can actually train yourself if it goes dull. Sometimes it will only dull one or two cutters, but it feels like the whole chain's gone dull. If you train yourself to look for those ones that have been dinged, you can take your file and true those up and go on. You don't have to file all of them and get through until you're ready to file again. So that's a, a saving factor as far as time and energy goes. And as far as if you've got a real dull chain, it's harder on your chainsaw, it's harder on your chain, your sprocket, your bar, all that stuff. And I, I will say one other thing as far as the maintenance of the saw goes, and then I think we get into the questions, is uh, your air filter. That's a stumbling blo block for a lot of people running a chainsaw. It's, it doesn't idle good, it doesn't throttle up good, and probably 80% of the time, it's gonna be, a dirty air filter. And most of these air filters on the saws that I use anyway, most of them, they have a little tab on the side. The best way to clean them is warm soapy water, slosh them around, rinse them off real good, 
and then let them dry overnight. And while I've got it off, I'm gonna clean uh, the, uh, the, the carburetor area out because a, a clean air filter, dirty inside the carburetor, when you start it up, it's gonna suck all that debris up into that nice clean air filter. So I choose to clean that off and it just makes it a little easier as far as the, the maintenance goes. So I hope that helped you out as far as running the chainsaw and servicing the chainsaw and the chain and all that. And Mike, if you have anything, go ahead. Uh, I think we're approaching the two hour mark. Uh, you know, we're more than willing to stick around and take questions. Uh, the, as you can well see, we, we really just scratched the surface here in terms of we haven't had a chance to get into the handling of the saw, um, you know, the stance, you know, how, how, to, how to position yourself so you can, you can run that saw safely um, and, and have it close to your body. I mean, body mechanics are quite important when it comes to chainsaw operation. Uh, they're probably the most important when it comes to chainsaw operation. That with filing. So everything pieced together, you know, should make you uh, a more efficient, safe, um, skilled operator. So uh, uh, with that said, uh, you know, we're willing to take questions here for a certain amount of time. Uh, make sure we answer your questions. If, if we don't have time to do so, you can contact us directly. Uh, uh, my office is uh, usually open um, during the week. So uh, if not, leave a message and we'll be sure to get back to you. If any of you uh, as uh, uh, operators want to get a group together, uh, I think uh, doing some outside work now, we can practice social distancing. Let's say there were seven of you, seven or eight of you that wanted to get a hands-on session. Uh, we're available to do so. I think that if everyone, uh, and, and do so for a reasonable price. So. Um, there's no question that these, these uh, tools are the, one of the most efficient that were ever um, invented and certainly, um, you know, can cause a whole lot of damage in a short period of time. And certainly, you know, any instruction, uh, you know, we haven't even gotten into the, uh, you know, the, the felling workshop. Um, you know, any of the directional felling and certainly that's, you know, that's quite involved. I mean, that can involve two or three days of instruction, but to give you a good felling workshop, I, I think you'd have to plan to spend, uh, you know, seven or eight hours in the field and, and that certainly uh, uh, can make you uh, that much more efficient, make your life that much easier. So uh, with that said, we'll take questions. Okay, I've got a series of questions on the chat. Uh, one of them is, any thoughts or comments on professional uh, lithium electric chainsaws um, with respect to relevant topics covered in today's program? I have one. I have two. I have two of the uh, lithium powered chainsaws and I have a, uh, a pole saw that takes the same batteries. And as far as the chaps goes, um, I have seen a video where someone took one of those battery powered chainsaws and did like I said, took it, made the test, and it stopped the chainsaw. Because I'd heard before that, oh no, that, that battery powered one's got so much power you can't stop it. Well, no it doesn't. It's going to jam it up and stop it just like a uh, uh, gas powered chainsaw. That answer the question? I think so. Yeah. Um, is there a way to identify the chain that is on the chainsaw? I think, I, I, believe, I believe they're talking about the one you're demonstrating on. Well, basically, if you have a smaller saw like this, it's gonna be a 0.325 pitch. And pitch is, um, if, if you take any three rivets in succession, and measure the distance and divide it in half, that gives you the pitch of the chainsaw. And that's not the sticky stuff that comes off the trees, that's as it arcs around, I believe, around the, 
the uh, the bend in the front of the bar. And so you take any three rivets in succession because there's none of them that are equal distance and divide it in half. And of course, on the uh, on the 325, you can't put it into an equal fraction. So you've got to convert it into a decimal. Now your next size up, your larger chainsaws, it's going to be a 3 8 pitch chain. So that means the three rivets that you measure is three quarters of an inch from the first one to the third one. You divide it in half and it's 3 8 So that's a 3 8 pitch. All right, so you've got that designation as far as uh, the chain goes. And then you've got the length of the chain. And remember I said the drive links, which are the ones that are stuck down in the bar. If you pull your chain off and you, you hold it up like this, I get two of the drive links side by side, and then I count down two, four, six, eight, all the way down. And my biggest saw is 68 drive links. So that denotes that it's a Husqvarna type chain saw with an 18 inch bar. The 66 drive links would be a steel chainsaw with an 18 inch bar. The best thing to do if you don't know is bring the chain into a dealer and say, this is what I get for a chain. If you got something that will match it. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, on the side of your bar, if you can still read that, there's, there's information on the side of the bar. And that can tell you whether it's 3 8 pitch or 3 2 5. And I think even the drive links on it, you'd have to look on your specific bar. And if you don't know, you could bring the whole chainsaw in or the chainsaw uh, bar and, and chain in and say, I need this matched up and they should be able to do that for you. Great. How do you know when a chain should be replaced? There is a scribed line. I'll bring it over so you can see. And uh, see that black line? On most of your chains today, it's called a witness mark. And when you get to that point, what I like to tell them is not a stump chain or a dump chain, it's a throwaway chain. Because you don't have enough support metal underneath on your side plate to hold that tooth on and it can break off. And if it does, there's no telling where that tooth that's broken off is gonna go. So it's very dangerous. So, once you get to that witness mark, you don't file any further than that. Great. Okay. And I think there's a connection, connecting question here. When a chain has been filed many times, how do you know when it's time to get a replacement? So is that the same, same answer? Well, yes, to a degree. If, if your filing's off, meaning you've got one side uh, chain that's your tooth is shorter than the other, and it gets to the point where you can no longer cut a straight line down through it, can't kind of runs and cups, then it's probably time to change it out because you've prematurely worn the side straps and might even have damaged your bar uh, because you can prematurely wear the side of the bar so that it will never fit down on true. And when you cut down through, a say, a log, you, it binds up. We call it cutting toilet bowls. It won't cut a straight line. Great. And then what type of cutting oil should be used? Are you talking about uh, bar and chain oil or the mixing oil that goes into the gas? Let me just I'm answer both of those. Yeah. Your bar and chain oil, there are different, different tacks or the tackingness of it. And in the summertime, you want to get uh, an oil that is, uh, the viscosity is like 30. It's a thicker oil. And then when it starts getting cold weather, you go to a 20 viscosity and then to a 10 viscosity so that it will actually lubricate the chain when it's extremely cold. So that's your bar and chain oil. I would always suggest go get the best you can because it's just gonna, it's, it's just gonna function better. And as far as your mixing oil for your chainsaw gas, don't ever use outboard two cycle mixing oil because there's always a water pump in the outboard and you don't have one on your chainsaw and it's going to ruin your chainsaw. So it has to be air cooled two cycle mixing oil. And uh, again, 
I wouldn't hesitate to, to direct people to the Husqvarna mixing oil, two cycle mixing oil, uh, the steel, Johnson Red, uh, Echo, or Dolmar. Those are some of the premium saws and I, and I wouldn't hesitate to direct them to those because it has the additives that are uh, better for the saw. And most of those mixing oils has a stable in it, which is something that addresses the ethanol gas. I try to not use ethanol gas because it's just conducive to bad experiences. And if it says 50 to one ratio, use exactly 50 to one ratio. Don't think you're gonna do your saws any favor by making a, a richer mixture of, of oil to gas because all it's gonna do is overheat and prematurely do your chainsaw in. So if it says 50 to one, it's 50 to one. Great. And then a uh, final question. I usually purchase a new chain, chain when it pulls to one side too much from poor sharpening. Any way to correct this problem? And there's a couple other questions he's got as, after that. If you, I don't know whether he's going with, with just a, uh, we call it freehand, which is no file guide, just a, just a fly, uh, file. And that's a lot of times, a lot of the prologues used to just use this. And they said, we've got strong side, weak side. And one side, the cutter was always longer than the other one. And the other one uh, was always uh, cutting faster. So you would end up uh, having it cut a curved line. So what I would strongly suggest if he's just freehanding to go with, get himself a file guide. And uh, like I said, once you've, once you've filed one side too aggressively, a lot of times there's no recovery of that chain. And there's been times I've seen a prologue where he not only had the chain filed too aggressively, but what it did was it caused the, the bottom of, his, the bottom of his, his side straps and on that aggressive side, the bar itself worn to the point where it could never flush down again. And so he could never cut a straight line down through the log with his chain. I told him, I said, you, you gotta go re replace your bar and your chain. But now that you understand how to use the file guide and how to file, you should never have that trouble again. So uh, how uh, far can I file the rakers before I need to purchase a new chain? More than likely, you're going to file the cutters beyond where you can use them before you file your rakers down to where it's not going to be usable. And like I said, uh, again, we're back to this, which is your depth gauge tool to maintain the 20 to 25 thousandths uh, that you're dropping your raker or your depth gauge down so that you have a good smooth safe cut all right so those tools uh like i said before um aren't tools to inhibit your ability to file they're used to enhance your ability to file so you're going to do a better job the chain's going to last longer it's going to be safer in you um, you're the final shock absorber so if you've got a chain that's you know giving you this kind of number uh, you're filing too aggressive and you need to kind of get, get the tools and do it right. I'm, I'm all for advocating a chain that when you cut down, it's very smooth when it cuts down through. Because it's not very settling when you've got one that's jumping all around and you have to hang on for dear life. So these tools, like I said, what I told you I did with mine, where I've dropped back from 25 thousandths down on the raker to 20 thousandths is all for people that are beginning so that it's not intimidating. It's very smooth in its application and you can do everything you need to do with a chainsaw. Great, final question. Does roller sprocket on end of the bar need to be greased? He never, I never do this. Okay, well, <laughs> the chains today, the drive link, which is the one that goes in the bar, uh, you probably didn't notice when I pull this off, it has little holes drilled through every one of the drive links. And that's all designed to deliver your Byron chain oil to your sprocket 
to lubricate it. And a lot of, uh, I think it was Oregon that had trouble with people not, not adhering to lubricating their, their bar sprocket properly. And by that I mean, this particular bar does not have a hole to put grease to it. And this is designed for your chain to lubricate it with a bar and chain oil. Per adventure, this bar had a hole for using the grease gun. You would clean the hole first. A lot of the guys were just taking the grease and pumping it in and there was crud in the hole. And when you do that, guess where the crud goes? Into the bearing forced in by the grease. So they were prematurely losing their bar uh, sprockets. And so if you're gonna lubricate it, make sure you clean the hole before you pump the grease to it. Uh, like I said, this one has never been greased because it can't be greased. Um, and they're doing more and more to um, initiate that kind of a bar. So like I said, if you, if you do have a bar that has a sprocket there, uh, you can grease it. There's nothing wrong with that. You just want to make sure you clean that little hole where the grease goes in first. Great. Um, so that, I, I think we better end it there. I know there was one more question, but um, I'm going to forward it to you folks, uh, Stephen and Mike, and um, you can respond to that uh, person's question on email. Um, and I was also um, just going to remind everyone, I sent out a, um, a handout that Mike uh, sent me to send to everybody. It's got his contact information, so I highly recommend um, everybody reach out to these fine folks um, and find out what kind of trainings are available and um, what other uh, resources there are for this type of topic. But I have a feeling we may be offering another uh, similar training online like this at some point. I think it's worked out pretty well. And I, the amount of information you just presented is mind boggling. It was wonderful. I appreciate it. A lot of people don't understand the, you know, the scope of what's involved with the chainsaw. And a lot of this is, is derived from, again, revelation knowledge, meaning other people that have been versed in chainsaws sharing with us. Soren Erickson, the world champion from Sweden, who used to come and train. I was personally trained by him multiple times. And then when I became a trainer working for Mike, uh, Mike had Soren come and train the trainers multiple times. And each time uh, it would be progressive in what we learn. And there's a lot out there as far as with the hands-on. Mike talked about the, the felling of the tree. There's also the limbing of the tree and all aspects of that. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot to it. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So I appreciate it. Again, um, if anybody has any questions, be in touch. Uh, use, look at the handout and you'll find the contact information. If you need information from us at Maine Woodland Owners, please be in touch with me, jen at mainewoodlandowners.org. You feel generous and you, and you feel like this is a great service and you'd like to support us and get us, um, support us in these types of uh, programs, uh, go to our website. We have a great donation page. We have our membership page if you're not a member, mainewoodlandowners.org. So we appreciate everyone's support. Um, and uh, we'll hopefully see you in the future on one of these programs. Our next program is July 30th with uh, Bob Seymour, uh, Fireside Forestry, uh, 9 a.m. on Friday the 30th. So please sign that, sign up for that. You'll see our, um, there's registration on our website, on our events page. Hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. And again, Mike, Steve, thank you so much for this program. It worked out beautifully. And we'll be talking Bye. to you very soon. Have a great, have a great weekend yourself there. And we'll, we'll, uh, everybody stay safe out there too, both with your chainsaw and with your health. Okay, thank you everyone. Bye-bye.